Well, welcome everyone. I'm glad that you are all braving the rain. It seems like it's been constant all day today. Uh, so I appreciate you all coming out to hear what I find to be a very important and, and valuable conversation uh, as part of not only Wealth and Poverty Week, uh, Wealth and Poverty Week uh, inequalities, action on inequality week, but also a conversation about the Shepherd Higher Educational Consortium on Poverty. My name is Steve Scanlon. I'm an associate professor in sociology and anthropology, and along with Dr. Rachel Terman um, uh, from sociology and Matthew Layton from political science. Um, for the last couple of years, uh, in collaboration with the Wealth and Poverty theme led by Dr. Young Kim, have been working uh, in connection with the Shepherd Higher Educational Consortium on Poverty to provide interns for uh, competitive interns, paid interns in the summers for, for our students here on campus. Um, the Shepherd Consortium, in brief, has officially existed since 2012, although it was originally founded um, as, as a local organization at Washington and Lee University in 1998. Um, Shepherd each year ha puts over 100 interns in the field at, at roughly 20 um, uh, different sites across the country and over 120 different agencies throughout the country. So it's a very active program, bringing together students uh, to do these interns from over uh, 20, uh, 20 to actually now 25 member institutions. The Shepherd Consortium was founded to really institutionalize uh, poverty studies on college campuses. The original founders believed that poverty studies wasn't something that was talked about enough. It's an interdisciplinary program intending to bring students from not just social work, right, not just sociology, anthropology, maybe where we have these conversations, um, you know, a lot, but, but business, medical schools, professional schools, professional programs, teaching, education, because as we get out in our professional lives, we'll realize that, that poverty and inequality touches all kinds of occupations, vocations, and so forth. So the idea behind SHEP is to have these conversations at institutions of higher education, have them between these institutions, and move forward developing a new generation of leaders who, who address these issues uh, in their daily work lives, professional lives, uh, social lives, and beyond. So tonight, um, again, this is one of my favorite things about the Shepherd program is that we get to hear from our interns. Uh, this is our second year of having a panel of interns who, who we've sent out over the summer um, at, at various locations to do all kinds of wonderful service um, for the Shepherd Consortium and representing Ohio University in doing so. What I will do is I will briefly just introduce each. Uh, I'll say the agency uh, for which they worked, uh, their major and so forth, and then, and then we'll hear directly from them. And they'll each talk about five minutes or so. Uh, and then we'll open it up for questions that you all may have and Dr. Terman may have and, 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 and everyone else. So we'll intend it to be a nice conversation once they, once they present their ideas and, and, and reflections and, and then we'll go from there. But thanks again for being here again on, on a rainy evening. And I will go, will go from, from my right to left and, and introduce each and that's the order in which they'll, they'll also be talking as well. So on my far right is, is Ms. Kayla Wood and Kayla's from Journalism. And Kayla uh, you, uh, was an advocacy intern for the United Planning Organization in Washington, D.C., and she'll tell you more about that. To Kayla's left is Mr. Bailey Williams. And uh, Bailey, and I'm sorry, and Kay, um, Kayla is, uh, yeah, HTC Journalism, actually, right? okay. And then Bailey Williams to the left of Kayla's HTC Economics. And Bailey was a legal assistant uh, for the Richmond Public Defender's Office this summer in Richmond, Virginia. To Bailey's left is Francesca Reif, and Francesca's a sociology major. And uh, Francesca worked as a legal advocate for Tapestry Incorporated, which is in Atlanta, Georgia. And then lastly, um, uh, to my immediate right, is Ms. Emily Walter. And she's an HCC Environmental Studies and also Urban Planning and Sustainability major. And she worked as a food justice organizer at New Roots Incorporated in Louisville, Kentucky. So with that, uh, I would like to start with, with Ms. Kayla and her experience. So my name is Kayla, again. Um, I was at the United Planning Organization. Um, I actually held two different positions there um, that we kind of combined into one internship to kind of cater to um, my major. So I did public relations and advocacy. So with that, I was actually in the office a lot more than um, out in the field. Um, so I was doing a lot of um, community outreach through um, email blasts, through social media. Um, I did outreach to potential donors um, and I kicked off the advocacy dis division's first um, public newsletter. Um, 
So that's kind of just what I did on day to day. Um, and then when I was actually able to go out in the field, um, we did a lot of different um, community organizing events to kind of mobilize community members to get um, involved in the legislative process, to kind of get more involved in their communities and becoming, um, you know, more passionate about where they live. Um, and the bulk of the work that we did was actually in the Washington Highlands community in, oh, sorry, I was in Washington, D.C. Um, probably should have led with that. <laughs> um, and um, Washington Highlands is one of the um, highest poverty, poverty levels in the city, and I think it's um, around 20th highest poverty level in the country um, as an individual community. Um, so UPO has been um, working in Washington Highlands for about five years now. Um, and yeah, I got to kind of do some of the community outreach there. We held a peace walk the first week that I was there, um, kind of protesting like gun violence um, and just promoting peace in the streets. Um, and it was really cool because um, kids got to lead that and I was able to kind of take video for that and participate and it was a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, um, it was a great experience. Um, hello everyone, my name is Bailey Williams again, and this past summer I spent it in Richmond, Virginia, working in the Public Defender's Office there um, in the city. Um, so basically what I did for eight weeks was that um, for the first half I worked with directly under mitigation specialists. So what we were doing were, was uh, conducting client interviews both with our defendants and then potential witnesses who might be called during the case. Um, we also did uh, jury research, so we would get a list of um, the people who would be on a jury for, or potential jurors for a trial, if it, the case had gone to trial, and we would try to do as much background or research on them to see what kind of person they are, the kind of beliefs that they held, um, because depending on those beliefs and then depending on the charge that our defendant was up against, it might be beneficial to have certain people with certain beliefs on the uh, jury as opposed to others. If we have somebody who is um, arrested for possession of uh, cocaine was one of, it, was one of our examples, we would really look for people who are kind of, especially people who push towards legal like marijuana for starters, we feel like they might have been a little bit more lenient on our clients. So we tried to really um, identify those people and get them on our juries if we could. Um, the second half of the internship, uh, I spent it with investigators who would actually go out into the field, uh, serve subpoenas, try to go to different uh, crime scenes and ask people who might have witnessed it, who aren't like official witnesses yet. But trying to get, again, as much background information on an event that had happened to really try to cast a story that are, that'll help our, def uh, our client as much as possible. Um, Aside from directly involved in the in stuff that would be relevant to our co uh, court case, um, we also provided or looked for services for our clients that they could use after their um, sentence sentence was given. Um, a lot of times they were just given probation, so we were looking for services to help them not violate that um, the probation term. So, a lot of our clients they were either homeless, they didn't have jobs, um, sometimes they were addicts. So oftentimes we would look for recovery services for them if they were trying to get off drugs. We would try to find stable housing for them if, if we could and they met the terms and we also try to look for employment for them if possible. So it was really multifaceted in what we did. It was a very interesting summer. Um, so I'm Francesca and I was at Tapestry Incorporated in Atlanta uh, to reiterate, I guess you already said that, but uh, I, um, what Tapestry does is, or at least what my role was, um, was as a legal advocate for victims of domestic violence in refugee and immigrant communities. Um, and I did a lot of different things. I um, was pretty much just whatever they needed me to do. Um, I learned a lot about domestic violence. Um, and they have other uh, departments that I learned about too, like human trafficking. Um, 
and they had a men's program too, so I learned about that. A lot of my responsibilities um, were to, I would fill out uh, and organize immigration petitions for clients um, because a lot of clients um, who are victims of domestic violence in those communities are um, have a lot of trouble doing those things because oftentimes their abusers will take control of their documentation um, or use it as a way to manipulate them and things like that. So I did a lot of that stuff and I learned a lot about uh, the process of immigration and um, how I learned a lot about there's a lot of uh, misconceptions I think about how all of that works and uh, the benefits available to immigrants in the United States. That was interesting. Um, I also, a big part of what I did is I would take clients to meetings that they needed to go to because a lot of them, um, due to like their lack of independence um, that was like forced upon them, don't have transportation or they don't know how to do things. Like I would take clients to go get their learner's permit for driving um, and those kind of experiences were always really interesting for me because I didn't know what I was doing either. <laughs> and a lot of times I didn't speak the same language as the person. Um, so it was just, I, I don't know, we just kind of like worked together as best we could to like figure it out and make it happen. Um, and yeah, that experience doing that was really great because things like that, uh, like when I got my learner's permit when I was 15, that wasn't a big deal to me. Um, it was just kind of like, okay, whatever. But for those women, like, they would just, like, cry tears of joy because that was just, like, such a big step for them, um, like, on their road to independence and living a better life and stuff like that. And part of um, my role as a legal advocate was when I would take them to do things like that, there are certain services that um, organizations that receive government funding are required to provide people, like uh, Title VI states that uh, they have to have um, interpreters or things in available languages. So when I would take people to take a permit test um, and they spoke Arabic, I would be like, you have to have this in Arabic and um, things like that. Just really advocating for the victim and what was best for them. Um, and then I would sort donations. Um, I went to, we had a domestic violence forum um, where we talked about uh, cultural competency, which was interesting to learn about because I hadn't heard of that before. Um, which is just the ability to um, like not just have knowledge that there's differences between cultures, but be able to like fluidly move between them and act appropriately, especially when dealing with victims of trauma. Um, so yeah, I had a lot of great experiences. Um, I definitely had some trouble at the beginning. Um, my car broke down on the way to the opening conference and was like totaled. Um, and my internship required a car. But um, with that being said, like. The Shepherd organization was so supportive and um, just really helped out a lot in that. And so were uh, the professors and faculty and everything. And everyone just like was like, it's going to be okay. We're going to make it happen. Like, don't worry about it. Um, so, yeah, it was definitely a great experience and a good learning experience, too. Cool. So, my name is Emily. Um, I interned at New Roots Incorporated in Louisville, Kentucky. And so New Roots is a food justice organization that really fights for fresh access to food for people in food deserts in Louisville. Um, and the issue of food deserts is way more prevalent in Louisville, Kentucky than I had imagined. Um, so the way that New Roots works on um, reaching for food justice in their community is through something called the Fresh Stop Market. And how this works is food insecure neighborhoods in Louisville will come together and reach out to New Roots and say that they want a fresh stop market. And a fresh stop market is a farm fresh pop-up market in community centers and churches um, that brings local organic food from the surrounding farms um, in like Henry County and Jefferson County to the people in urban Louisville. Um, so after the people come to New Roots, they're like, all right, let's start, let's start this market. So the markets are driven by volunteers entirely. Um, New Roots helps facilitate the organization of that, the planning with the farmers of how we get the food, um, but it's, all, it's always really volunteer driven. Um, New Roots will come as support, but really it's the people of the community that are fighting for their own access to food. And so the way a market works is that the community members, the people that need food, will pool their resources on a sliding scale basis to purchase the food ahead of time from the farmers. 
So there's, uh, there's four different levels of payment for what is considered a share of fresh produce. And a share every other week is uh, a variety of 10 fresh fruits and vegetables that are seasonally available and appropriate. Um, so one week we could have strawberries and blue potatoes and kale, and the next week we could have squash and collard greens. So it varies week by week on what is available and what the community members want. Um, so when the community members pool their resources, they can either pay $6 if it's a family on WIC, $12 if a family is 185% of the poverty level or lower, uh, $25 if they're considered higher income, or $40 which is the food justice share. So all of the money gets pooled into one pot to then pay the farmers a appropriate value, like a living wage for the food that they provide. And paying ahead of time for the food really reduces the risk for the farmers. So that way if they were coming to a, a farmer's market, say, in a low income neighborhood, they perceive that there's a lot of risk there, which is predominantly why they don't go into low income neighborhoods. They know they can make more money from people in high income areas of Louisville, that somebody will pay $7 for a loaf of bread versus the low income communities where maybe that's not possible. So we immediately get rid of that risk and ensure that farmers will get the, the fair price that they deserve for their produce. So everybody pools their resources and then we hold this fresh stop market bi-weekly. So every other week in the same location in 12 different neighborhoods in Louisville, we hold a market where then people come and pay for their share for the next week pick up their share for this week, and they go around to all these different tables, and each table has a different uh, item of produce on it. So it's sort of like you're grocery shopping for vegetables that you've already paid for, um, and we display it very beautifully because we want it to be a dignified experience. We want people to feel like they're, they're at a farmer's market that's created for them as opposed to like picking up something from a food pantry. So on one table you'll have kale like beautifully displayed and I'll have a little cute chalkboard that I got to make that says like organic kale from Rootbound Farm, take one bundle. And they'll take it and they'll put it in their reusable fresh stop bag and onto the next table. And every table has a volunteer behind it um, that's considered a veggie cheerleader. And so somebody will sit behind a table and be like, here's why you need to take this kale. Because sometimes people are like, I don't know what kale is. I don't like kale. That looks really gross. So the, the volunteer, which is oftentimes kids, uh, which is really great to see them excited about vegetables, will be like, kale's amazing. I made this with my kale. And you can try this too. Um, we also have like a cheat sheet on every single table that has recipes and storage information so that people know what to do with the vegetable that's in front of them. Because unfortunately in a lot of these low income communities, the only food that's available is a KFC and a corner store and like those don't have kale. Um, so that's the way the markets work. Um, there were 12 locations in Louisville every other week. So we would do six one week, six the next week. Um, but what I thought was really impressive about New Roots is that not only are we based out of Louisville and have markets in Louisville, the model has expanded to places like Southern Indiana, um, to Eastern Kentucky and Appalachia. There is a, a market in Hazard. Um, there's markets in Lexington, Kentucky. And all of that happened because community members were like, we're fresh food insecure and we want to do something about it. So they came to New Roots and they're like, can we use your capacity to help us get food to the people in our community that are being left behind? So. My primary role as a food justice organizer, which uh, was very unclear to me because this was the first time they ever had a shepherd intern. Um, and in past they've had 10 interns every summer. So this year they had 11. Um, but the 10 interns come from uh, communities in Louisville through a program called Summer Works, which is when the mayor of Louisville sets aside a budget to pay students from ages 16 to 21 in the city of Louisville to work at nonprofits. Um, so there were 10 other interns with me and so I was like, wow, I'm probably not going to be doing much if there's 11 of us. Um, but I found a lot to do. Uh, predominantly, I took orders over the phone for shares. So I did a lot of phone banking, calling people to remind them to order their share for the following week, um, reminding people to pick up their share, uh, calling them to see if they can continue to buy shares, because many times people will just disappear. And you're like, what's going on? Because uh, a main focus of New Roots is making sure that nobody gets turned away for lack of funds. Um, so we call people and we check in and ask, like, how are you doing? And if people are like, I can't afford to buy shares anymore, we fundraise to make sure that they can have shares. So I did a lot of that. Um, I canvassed and went to places relating to people with low income in the city of Louisville to pass out information about New Roots and the Fresh Stop markets. So I went to the WIC office that was um, directly adjacent to one of our markets and told them, like, hey, there's a market happening right here. You should come and see what it's like. Um, maybe buy a share for next time. I went to health departments and passed out information, encouraging them to talk to the people that they encounter. 
uh, about new roots. I went to doctor's offices, all sorts of places. Um, and I also made the little cheat sheets that we'd have at every market for volunteers that said, like, this vegetable will be on this table, display it like this, and write this on the chalkboard. Um, so I did a lot of logistical behind the scenes information, but then I also went to, I'd say, three or four markets a week, um, every single week. And at the market, I was sometimes a veggie cheerleader. Um, sometimes I would help the chef, because at every market, we also have a chef that uses all of the ingredients from the share to make a dish and then give samples and print out recipes so people can try something with those vegetables in it and then have a paper copy if they like it to go make it at home. So sometimes I would help the chef and plating things and cutting up potatoes. Um, and other times I would just do a lot of the manual labor, like setting up tables, setting up the tents when we have markets outside, um, carrying all of the boxes of produce off of a truck and putting it inside the cold church before the market starts, and then carrying it outside and putting it on all the tables. So I did that, um, and I'm not sure if that qualifies me as an organizer, but I went all over the place and it was, it was really fun. And in terms of the rest of Shepherd experience, um, because there's a lot to the experience besides just the organization you're working at, um, you have a cohort, so other people from other schools who are in the Shepherd program will live in the same location as you and work at different agencies. So I had the pleasure of living with uh, four women in a convent in Louisville, which was something else. Um, but yeah, that was a really neat experience to, to live with other students working at other agencies and to come home and have communal meals and hear about their experiences. Um, working with people in poverty in the city. Um, also, I didn't have a car, so I had to ride my bike to work, which was an hour and five minute commute on my bike in 95 degree Louisville weather, which was a blast. Honestly, it really was, but it makes me really grateful that I can walk like six minutes to class here. Um, but yeah, it was definitely a different experience being in a, a different locality with a different culture. I'd never been in the South before for an extended period of time. Um, I'd also never lived in an urban center before. Um, so just both of those things combined with the experience of working for a food justice organization and learning the intricacies of a nonprofit and all the bureaucracy you have to go through to get any sort of justice work done. Um, it was very challenging, both physically and emotionally, but I'm very happy that I had the pleasure to do so. That was way longer than five minutes. I'm <laughs> sorry. You were on a roll, so I, thought <laughs> I thought I was going to talk for like three, but... <laughs> well, let's, let's first thank our panelists for that. Sure. And what I would do, I would do some moderation, or I would be the moderator for questions and discussion. I kind of warned them that I might have a couple canned questions that I wanted to throw out to them, and I gave them a hint, hint at that. Um, and actually, this is um, the last of Emily's comments kind of leads into this, because what Shepard does is it is a paid internship. So, you know, the paid internship is a wonderful thing. We don't often have paid internships. But the trick is, or the challenge is, is that it's a subsistence wage paid internship. So Shep pays your room and board, your, your house, at a convent or your house at, 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 uh, on college campuses or they'll rent a house or an apartment. And the idea of communal living is really important. So you will live with other students, as Emily alluded to, from other universities who are in the same city doing internships at different places. So the beauty of Shep being paid in a, a subsistence wage is that you really do have to, you know, that, that $12, $14 a day, was it? Yeah, okay. $14 a day, you have to kind of pull your resources to buy that that spaghetti and that sauce and those vegetables or, or that rice or whatever you're making because together it goes a lot further than if you were just independently, you know, doing it on your own and so forth. So, so I guess my, you know this is where this is going. Um, I would like to ask each of you maybe just to reflect on what that was like, like the significance of you living on, you know, $14 a day while you were serving people who were in the types of communities that, and, and I'll just throw it out there. You can go in any order if you don't want to answer or choose to pass. Go ahead, anyone who likes to dive in on that. I can start if we want to go back down the line. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so my situation was actually a little bit um, different for Shep. Um, so we lived in dorms at Howard University. Um, and the way that, so we got there and we were expecting to all kind of be in the same hallway um, all together. You know, so that we could kind of do family meals and come together as a group. And there, there were 14 of us. Um, it's one of the bigger cohorts, I think, um, in Shep. And um, we got there, and they gave us room assignments, and we were spread out over two buildings that had about 5,000 people per building. And um, so <laughs> that was a little interesting. But we wound up um, either getting one or two roommates or no roommates um, in the Shepherd cohort. So I was lucky enough to actually have a roommate 
Um, and it was really interesting having to buy food with one other person um, because we pretty much we pretty much shared everything. I mean, there were a couple things where we kind of marked that it was <laughs> off off limits. Um, mainly, mainly chocolate and uh, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, but it was um, it was really awesome to kind of be able to like come home from work, and my roommate would come home from work, and we would sit together and make dinner. Or um, if it like we tried to schedule family dinners for the whole fourteen cohort members, but that didn't work out a lot. Um, but it really does teach you how far. Uh, $14 can go or how short it can go. Um, but yeah, I, I learned to really love Trader Joe's. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my experience is a little different. Um, including myself, there was seven people in a four bedroom house. Um, so we were all kind of occupying the same space. The house wasn't very big. Um, but what we did was we planned um, meals from Sunday through Thursday. We always did dinner together for those days. And then on the weekends, it was kind of like like doing your own thing. Um, some of my roommates were 21, so a lot of times they went out on the weekends and kind of did their own thing, which was, I mean, it was fine. Um, I'm not 21, so I didn't really go. Um, but like lunch was on your own, which was pretty easy, but planning the meals wasn't too bad. Everybody was kind of easy to, you know, make food for. Um, Overall, it really wasn't wasn't too bad, and it didn't really it wasn't that expensive. We split a lot of the costs for other like like toilet paper and dish soap and that kind of thing. So we saved a lot of money and it wasn't really difficult. They were kind of they were really easy to work with. Um, so I had a different living experience too. I was in dorms at Georgia State University, um, but they weren't dorms in the traditional sense. It was like apartment style dorms. Um, so we, I shared my apartment kind of, I had like a kitchen, um, and, uh, we had our own rooms with bathrooms. And so I just shared that with one other person. So it was super nice. Um, I was kind of like, I might have to transfer here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is a real dorm. Uh, so, um, yeah, that was really nice. And everyone that was in my cohort in Atlanta was in the same hallway. Like we were all next to each other. So even though we weren't like living like in the same like house or anything, um, we still had like kind of a sense of community and a few times, not a lot, but probably like three times we would uh, all go over to one person's room and just sit and just like talk and vent about our experiences, which I think is really impor important in nonprofit work um, because they, uh, what is it called? Emotional labor. Thank you. Emotional labor. Um, so yeah, to like get that stuff out is important and bond over like shared experiences and frustrations. And then um, as far as the uh, $14 a day goes, I was like, I didn't do this because like the constraint was like that difficult, but I just ate ramen noodles every day because like that's just the kind of person I am. And like <laughs> I really just like don't want to cook and stuff and I kind of wanted to save money, but I didn't like have to. I was just like pretty much just like being kind of lazy. So um, I didn't really struggle much with that just because they're like, I don't know, like what, like 35 cents or something. So it wasn't like <laughs> a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, my roommate and I got along though and everything. And uh, yeah, we like shared some of our stuff and it was, it was good. Um, I was fortunate enough that uh, my, the shepherd gives you um, extra money on top of your uh, $14 a day if you have a car, if your internship requires it. So some require it and some don't. Some people in my cohort brought their car, but it wasn't required. So Shepard didn't like give them extra money for like their, their mileage or their gas or anything like that, um, or their parking permit at the college or anything. But my uh, job tapestry also paid for my mileage at work because I would drive like 200 miles every two weeks. Um, so they reimbursed me at like 53 cents a mile, which is like a lot. So um, yeah, so that definitely was nice because I, like I said, I was driving a lot. <laughs> so yeah. For those doing the math, that'd be 42 servings of ramen out of the $14 a day. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. That's living large, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Emily, did you want to add anything else? Yeah. To the, yeah. Um, I think sort of there's an assumption in a lot of the, the shepherd cohort 
that $14 a day is a challenge for many college students because it's a deviation from the norm. But I think it's important to recognize that a lot of college students are in poverty, even at their home institutions, um, and especially with a $14 a day wage. Um, so like I didn't really find it to be that challenging because it's budgeting is like a real day-to-day -day reality um, when I'm here at OU. So to me, it was like $14 like sounds pretty good most days. $98 like, a week. Yeah, <laughs> like, like when I'm at OU, I spend like $15 a week on groceries and maybe like $10 on cookies at Donkey or fun things. <laughs> so yeah, I didn't find it to be super challenging on the day-to-day. -day. The only time that I had to really think about the constraint is when I wanted to do uh, things that were different than my day-to-day -day routine on the weekends. Um, so if I wanted to go um, go places on the weekends outside of Louisville, if I wanted to go to events in Louisville, for example, there was Four Castle Music Festival in Louisville, um, which is a, a really fun event to go to, I heard, but I didn't go because <laughs> it was like $45 a day. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's like four days. <laughs> so yeah, I didn't go to that. Um, but that was really the only time that I had to think about those sorts of things. And I think I was also very fortunate to have new roots and a fresh stop market at my advantage because I paid the 185% of the poverty level rate for a share of fresh vegetables every two weeks. So I paid $12 every two weeks and got enough vegetables to feed me for about a week and a half. Um, and I had enough to even share those with my roommates. And sometimes I like I could just not get them to eat vegetables because they were <laughs> stuck on the ramen. They're like, oh, I got to get ramen too. Um, so I like had extra colored greens and I was like begging my roommates to eat those. So I didn't really have troubles spending money on food at all. Um, I found it to be just fine. And yeah, I think for some people it could be a good learning experience to have to learn how to budget and help them become uh, more in touch with the people that they're working with through their organization. But for other people, it's the same thing as living at OU. So yeah. Great. Thank you all. Um, and then I'll ask one more kind of canned question comment from the panel, and then we'll open it up with all the questions that you all may have. So um, if you could recall, um, and you can either do one or both of these or whichever one you choose, what do you think the most either challenging uh, or most fulfilling part of your summer internship would be? If you can recall from your memory. And again, you can dive in as you wish or go down the line. Or challenging or fulfilling or both? Can we go down the line again? Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, the probably one of the most challenging things for me personally um, was when I arrived at um, my agency um, and then like even further like when I was doing a lot of the work in the field um, I was pretty much the only white person um, and that's not something that I've ever experienced um, and it was, it made me feel like it was going to be really hard to communicate and to um, get the people that I was working with to under, or to believe that I could help them in some way or that um, they could like help teach me things. Um, and I was really worried that I would just have that like big connection barrier. Um, but that wasn't the case. Um, everybody was really welcoming to me. Um, and it was very easy to talk to people in the field. Um, people were more excited that I was like there to help. Um, there were like a couple like oddball incidents where people were like, you don't belong here. And I was like, well, but I'm here, so. <laughs> um, so that was kind of the biggest challenge, I guess, that I faced, but it wound up being a non-challenge um, because once I actually got there and started doing the work, um, I realized like that was all in my head. Um, so if any of you do decide that you want to do um, Shepherd or something similar um, and you face like a similar um, problem, because I, I see that a lot of us in the room here are white or white passing, um, just don't let that, like, I mean, like, it might cross your mind, but don't let that, like, be a barrier to your work. So, yeah. Um, I think probably the biggest challenge working at the public defender's office was some of the clients that we had to defend in court, trying to come up with, like, lines of defenses and 
motivations to defend them based off some of the crimes that they had committed. Um, two in particular, we one was convicted, one was yet to go to trial. But I remember for one of them, the convicted person, I had to go to a jail with one of our mitigation special, specialists <clears throat> and conduct an interview for um, a man who had raped his daughter. So it was really challenging having like this crisis of conscience. Like you're there to do a job to represent somebody and hope that based off whatever punishment that they get, you're trying to minimize that because at the end of the day, you're hoping that once they're finished with that, they're able to re-enter society and be a better person because of it. And you truly have to believe that because you're helping a person that they will take that to heart and realize the error of their ways and try to become a better member of society after their punishment is given out. Um, so that was definitely one of the harder parts of my internship. I will say the probably more beneficial positive aspects of it was you have some people who were your, your clients who might have been kind of, lack of a better term, kind of shafted by the system a little bit. Um, seeing the work that you were able to do um, to benefit them and they are actually able to beat a system and other, at other times that it's kind of stacked up against them. Um, having that happen was, it kind of made all the frustration that had built up over time from that work more rewarding and can't, kind of gave me like a purpose and made my work feel valuable. So. Um, I guess the biggest challenge for me um, as far as like my internship itself went was uh, probably um, I usually don't like like if there's a new experience if it's something I haven't done I usually am just like let's just not do it like mm -hmm. <laughs> like why worry about it like I'll just like pass on it so my everything that I did at work was a completely unknown experience to me so even just like I would go to immigration court or um, like court for temporary protective orders like family court and I have no idea what that's like I don't know what I need to bring I don't know what I'm not allowed to bring um, things like that where it was just like just the process was completely unknown to me and like not that I didn't have people at my work that would like talk to me about those things or like help me with things that I was worried about um, but a lot of experiences like that where I was just like anxious about things um, but at the end of the day it seemed like everything I was worried about um, like just turned out fine and and uh, a lot of the things were actually great experiences um, so I guess I kind of learned like a life lesson in that aspect and then um, as far as like just the experience in general I think one of the things that um, I struggled with is uh, like I really had a tendency to just like it's I never realized how like just severely exhausting working nine to five is uh, <laughs> because in my head like I used to work 12 hour shifts in like food service and it wasn't like I would get home at one in the morning and stay up till four and it was like whatever but uh, I don't know if it's because of the kind of work that you're doing but I would get off at five and it would like I would get home at six and I would just be like I am so exhausted like I cannot do anything I was like I don't understand how people have like a social life or like a child and they like just managed all that somehow because I was just like I just want to sit in my room and just like watch YouTube <laughs> and then get up and do it all over again and so like I struggled with isolating I guess like that um, but having that cohort and having those people around really helps pull you out of that and you just have to make sure that you're taking advantage of those like experiences that you can have um, because you're in a new city and that's kind of intimidating too but there's like always a lot of cool things to do around and new experiences um, to have. And then I think um, something that was really fulfilling was just watching um, like clients just mature and like just see them have like little successes that meant a lot to them. Um, and just, yeah, like see their immigration petitions get approved or take them to an immigration appointment that they're really nervous about and then it goes fine and they're just like so happy. Um, so that was definitely really fulfilling. I'm going to start with the most fulfilling first because I think that's more positive. Um, so I think the best experience that I had through my work in Louisville um, was at the same time I was there, there was a big Occupy ICE movement happening in the city. Um, so there was a camp that set up in front of the ICE detention center in downtown Louisville called Camp Compassion. 
um, and it was a collaboration between a group called La Casita, um, a group called Conmigente, and another group, um, Black Lives Matter Louisville, to demonstrate in front of ICE um, in protest against family separation. Um, so they created a camp to sit there as long as it took for the ICE uh, detention center in Louisville to shut down, which was an ambitious goal, um, but they were very dedicated. Um, so there was a core group of maybe around 20 people that were there initially, and then people would come um, throughout the day and support them. So at peak times, there were maybe like 50 or 60 people there. At night, there were maybe like 15 to 20 people there. Um, but all of these people need food. Um, and people were donating a lot of like processed goods, like granola bars and things like that. But the people that were there all day, every day um, in protest didn't have any fresh food there. Um, so after one of our Fresh Stop markets, we had a bunch of shares that people didn't come to pick up and were like, what do we do with this food? It's going to go to waste. Um, all the people that were volunteering already had food. Um, the people at the convent with me already had food. So we decided to take a bunch of the shares and take our butane stoves um, that we take with us to every market to do cooking demonstrations to the Occupy Ice Camp and we made food for everybody so everybody could have hot food there while they were protesting family separation. And that was really fulfilling because like, I felt like I contributed to the movement, um, but also that food didn't go to waste and people got to be happy and healthy for another meal. So that was very fulfilling. Well, there are some negatives, unfortunately. Um, through organizing, I found out some of the contradictions in the social welfare system in the state of Kentucky, particularly relating to food. Um, so Karen, who was my director, and I went to talk to the WIC office um, after one of our markets um, about encouraging the women that go to the office or the people with children to come to our markets and buy shares. Um, but the WIC office has a mandate that they cannot promote anything other than farmers markets because they give women farmers markets vouchers. So for every growing season, women will get $10 in vouchers for fresh food from a farmers market. And that's it. Uh, they get $10 at a farmers market and that's like a jar of organic peanut butter for like a whole summer. Um, so Karen and I were trying to talk to the director about like, what do we do when that money runs out? What do you tell them? And the woman was like, well, your program requires them to pay for food and our program doesn't. So like, we can't promote that. Like, you're not actually helping these women if they have to pay out of pocket. But if they're only getting a jar of peanut butter with the $10, like, they're going to have to pay out of pocket somewhere. And if they don't know about New Roots in the Fresh Stop markets, they're probably paying out of pocket at a corner store or at Walmart for food that is inexpensive, which is often food that's not healthy and fresh. Um, so that was a big barrier there, trying to figure out how to draw these women into our fresh stop markets when the only information they're provided is about these farmer market vouchers, which don't get them anything. Um, but also, in the state of Kentucky, every single county in Kentucky, except for the county in which Louisville is in, can use um, WIC at their WIC benefits at farmer's markets and at fresh stop markets, but women in Jefferson County can't just that one county. Um, and there's sort of a question of like, is this systematically racist? Because Jefferson County has the largest proportion of African American women in the state of Kentucky. Um, I think the city is like 53% African American and the rest of rural Kentucky, while it has people of color, is not quite the same proportion. So it seems like there's some sort of discrimination there when women in Jefferson County and urban Louisville can't use their WIC benefits for fresh food, but they can at other places. So we had people come to Fresh Stop Markets and be like, this is interesting, can I use my WIC benefits here? And we had to tell them no, because the state of Kentucky wouldn't allow them to pay with WIC benefits. They could use SNAP benefits, but they couldn't use their WIC benefits. So um, New Roots started a fund called the McKee Lee Fund um, to accept donations to pay for women on WIC the, for a $6 share versus a $12 share because $12 is generally the baseline, but thanks to the fund, women on WIC only have to pay $6. So that way, given that they can't use their WIC benefits, they can still get produce relatively inexpensively that is fresh and organic. Um, but yeah, it's very frustrating to see that like the system which is intended to help women um, get access to food and access to public funds is working against them and preventing them from getting fresh food when they need it most. Well, thank you all for, for sharing. I know those challenges and those, those high points were, were certainly an important part of the, this summer. And 
sounds like many of you learned as well as were challenged and uplifted by the same thing. So appreciate your sharing. Let me um, open it up now to the floor with any questions that you all may have <coughs> about their experiences or about CHEP in general or, or any other things that you, you would like to add or, or are curious about. So don't be shy. It's now your, your time. Other, oh, there we go. Otherwise, we're going to have to hear from Dr. Terman. So, so, uh, go. so you can uh, call somebody else. No, no, go ahead. You're the only hand right now. So. Um, for those who don't know, uh, the chef, part of the CHEP program um, matches students with uh, their interests. So it wasn't random that you ended up at these internships, right, that they identified organizations that they were interested in working with and also um, experiences that might connect to their academic work that they're doing here at OU and that they're going to continue to do this year um, and, and ideas they might have about their future career, that kind of thing. And so um, I wonder if you could share, and you don't all have to respond if, if you don't have an idea about this, but um, if any of you had an experience that did um, help you think more deeply about the academic work you're doing here, or maybe it um, you had an idea about going into this type of work and now you're thinking, maybe not, I'll go to grad school instead or something like that. Um, so any kind of reflection you have about the connection between your academic work and your internship. Um, yeah, uh, I kind of was like thinking about doing nonprofit work um, after school, um, but wasn't quite sure. Um, and I wasn't quite sure like where in like the nonprofit world I would fit. Um, and this summer just kind of like really validated that that's what I want to do. Um, it also validated that um, I want actually to go to law school um, after doing um, communications in a nonprofit in DC, um, preferably maybe going back to UPO. Um, I'm still volunteering with them. Um, and then beyond that, um, I, kn I know I want to do like civil rights law. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um complete opposite direction. Um, <laughs> um, working in a public defender's office made me kind of realize that I don't want to go to law school anymore. <laughs> that was always on the table, but after the summer, I kind of think like, and not because like the work, I didn't value the work that they were doing, but I felt like working in the public defender's office, you were only kind of, you were like one soldier against this entire like force that is trying to for me, like incarcerate poor people of color, and I feel like just one person working in a public defender's office is not going to be able to change that system that is allowing that to happen. So what I felt after this experience would be a better calling for me is going to grad school. Um, I'm now looking at doctorate programs and kind of trying to find macro level ways to really impact these. Um, horrible situations that people are often caught up in. Um, like I said, I just one person in a public defender's office just didn't work for me. I kind of wanted to find policy solutions to these issues to kind of prevent them from happening. Um, I don't think that my internship changed like my career trajectory a lot, uh, just because I've always kind of wanted to work at a nonprofit. Um, not really sure what I wanted to do. Uh, after having worked at the one that I did work at, I was kind of like, I don't know, like it wasn't bad, like it was pretty stressful, I could take it or leave it, so I don't really know, like it didn't really like make up my mind one way or another. Um, as far as like relating it to class, um, like things that I've learned in class, um, as a sociology major, a lot of what my classes focus on is inequality um, and how uh, like the negative stereotypes or like perceptions of that a dominant group in society has about um, a minority group, how those affect um, ne the negative impacts of that. Uh, and I definitely saw a lot of that firsthand with um, working with victims of domestic violence and immigrant communities specifically, just because um, I think that a lot of people don't realize that uh, like immigrants really do like know that like, like they really feel like everyone here hates them. like. And when they're in an abusive relationship, their abuser uses that against them. Like, no one here likes you. They don't want you here. Like, you don't know how to speak the language. Like, 
no one wants to help you and wants you here, so you need me. Like, if they're a citizen, they'll be like, you need me to, like, help you navigate here because otherwise, like, you you have no way of, like, like getting by or, like, um, having an income or things like that. Uh, so that was just interesting. Um, I guess, I mean, obviously, like, really sad, but um, it just kind of reinforced, I guess, like, my passion about what I study. I think one thing that I learned through working in a nonprofit is just the limits that justice work has inside a nonprofit. Because at the end of the day, not only is like the goal of the organization, at least with New Roots, providing food for people, but it's also the continuation of New Roots, um, both for the, the sake of bringing food to people, but also for the livelihoods of the people that work within New Roots. Um, so there's limits to what they can do in terms of like protesting things like the way that WIC works um, because they need to continue existing as an organization. So I think nonprofit work is very important and should continue, but it can't alone solve like corporate control of food production and unequal access to food in cities. So I think it must be used in tandem to social movements, um, which is something I had considered before but had seen very clearly through my work this summer. Um, but I also agree that it had reinforced my desire to work within nonprofits because I think as of now, they're the most important vehicle for on the ground change. And I think New Roots had a really great model for incorporating people from the community rather than using a top down method of bringing food to people. It's very bottom up and I appreciated that. Um, and I don't think all nonprofits operate that, that way, but working within one that did really reinforced within me that I want to work in a nonprofit like that. But also I learned that like I would really love to live in Louisville, Kentucky, um, which like never crossed my mind before. Um, but it's such a beautiful city and has so much culture and the park spaces are amazing and all of the housing and architecture is absolutely beautiful. And yes, I would really like to live there and maybe work for a nonprofit, maybe not New Roots, but um, I also learned that sometimes nonprofits that have very justice oriented focuses and work to reduce systemic racism, still have ingrained racism within them, um, which is unfortunate, but is a product of like the rhetoric of society. But I heard like many offhanded comments, um, even by people that work in tandem, about how people of color are inferior in some way to people that are white, or even people of color saying other things that are racist about people of color. Um, so yeah, I think there's still work to be done in and out of nonprofits to reduce racism, um, both in our food system, but also in the way that we treat one another. And I wasn't expecting that. And it was hard to have emotional conversations with your coworkers that you have to see every day about why maybe the things that they do and say like aren't appropriate and aren't even best for our mission. And that was also challenging um, in reference to the last question, but rewarding in the long term to be able to come together towards the larger goal and put aside differences that may be so deeply ingrained that we don't even realize that we think them, but to actively work to uh, deconstruct those ideas that we have about one another. Questions, other questions or comments or anything? Yes, please, Dr. Kim. Thank you. <laughs> I'm young human geography. <laughs> Any of you uh, can talk to your friends about your internship experience during the internship or after the internship. So I'm asking this question. I was wondering what if we had a lesson, Facebook, you see, so then you, four, five of you could have shared that experience during the internship or even after when you and your friends, that those who were working or who had a study abroad program during the summer, so I, it just occurred to me, has it ever occurred to you that it could have improved your experience or others' experience or learnings from the internship if you had that kind of social media? Um, I know Personally, one of my uh, main jobs was um, actually to run the social media for UPO. So, I mean, I posted on their social media every day, but I like shared a lot of it on my own social media, um, which I think was a great way to kind of start the conversation and um, talk to my friends without like direct, like directly having a conversation 
um, face to face. Um, but I think it would be. Uh, I thought I think it would have been a little bit more interesting if um, I talked more about the shepherd experience itself. Um, because I mean, I, I vented to my friends and family, mm -hmm. and then I vented to my shepherd cohort about things. But um, the experience itself, I think, um, ad, adds a lot to working in the nonprofit. If that makes sense. I, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so it's kind of difficult for me to kind of talk on social media about the work that I was doing, since a lot of it's supposed to be kept private in regards to our clients. Um, but. As Kayla said, the work itself, or the shepherd experience as a whole, I haven't really shared much of it with people, but like on social media. But I sometimes been talking with folks who are interested in trying to get an internship, especially a paid internship, mm -hmm. and I always recommend the shep internship to them. Me too. Um, yeah, it's, there's and this like such a wide array of internships that are available for several different people. Um, I mean, legal work, food work, uh, immigrant work. So it's like there's a lot of different fields for people to go down and it's, it's I think it's great especially when students are like desperate for paid internships over the summer or else they're not going to get them because they just flat out can't afford it so social media not as much sharing but like definitely like personal one-on-one -on -one connection or talking with people when it comes to if they're interested in them or not um, yeah, I guess I, I agree with that. I, um, my organization also encouraged us to um, post on our personal Facebook pages and like tag them in it. Um, but I also, uh, it was hard to talk to people about like specific things because my agency really stressed confidentiality too. Um, mm -hmm. So there were times I would like call my mom and start talking about something and then I'd have to be like, wait, I can't like, like it's, it's a, like a, a difficult line to toe to know like what you're allowed to talk about and what you're not. So I guess most of the time I would just prefer to like not talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as the experience goes, I definitely shared a lot about that with my friends. I actually had friends drive down and visit me when I was in Atlanta. Um, and so I got to share a lot of like what I like was doing with them. Um, so yeah. Uh, towards the end of my internship, like one of the last weeks I was there, um, like the NBC Louisville News affiliate um, came and did a segment on one of our markets and how it works, um, and gave all of the information on how to become a shareholder um, on TV. So that was really great, and I took that link to like the online transcript and the video. Um, from the NBC webpage and posted it on Facebook with like a, a short summary about the organization I worked for and how happy I was to have had that experience. Um, so that was the only real social media presence I had. On Instagram I shared lots of like pretty pictures of like blueberries and tomatoes <laughs> to be like, wow, look at this food. Um, but I guess that doesn't really do a whole lot for saying about like the intricacies of working in nonprofit. Um, but it did advertise nice blueberries. Um, but yeah, I've talked to my friends a lot about my experience because as great of as, as a lot of it was, it was also very challenging, especially living with roommates um, that maybe had very different perspectives on things as me, maybe didn't take their work as seriously. There was a lot of conflicts there um, that I definitely ranted about to my friends. Um, but yeah, I've also talked about the, the highlights of the internship um, with my friends. and. The sad part is a lot of my friends are at schools that are not partner schools with Shepherd or are seniors now and can't do the program next year. Um, so as much as like advertising the program, I'm not really doing a good job at that, but <laughs> it's still fun to talk about. Probably, um, unless there's one more question, we should probably wrap up and I'll wrap up, but is there one more question that somebody would like to throw out or? Okay, um, I'm, I, I will kind of volunteer them. They, they might be able to answer questions individually if you have a specific question afterwards. But I just want to, again, thank our panelists for, for telling some wonderful uh, rec recollections from their summer experience uh, and, and in terms of sharing their, their, their good, the bad, and, and also your day-to-day. -day. I would like to say right now um, we're, we're in a bit of flux with regard to the SHEP program. We're, we're in our kind of hoping to, to, to find bridge money. Uh, we're going to apply for a grant in November that will hopefully carry on the program. Um, but right now, we have to have bridge money to get there. So if anybody has a rich uncle or good ideas, you, you could certainly let me know. Um, but anyway, uh, we think it's very valuable. And I think that, that the, the, the interns this year as well as last year can attest to that. Um, if you have questions or if you want to learn more, you can contact myself, uh, scanlin.s at ohio.edu. I'm also on Bentley Annex. Uh, Dr. Terman, um, 
uh, who had a, a, just left for another commitment. I can't think of Rachel's email, but Terman. Terman at Ohio.edu. Is, is it Terman? Yeah. Okay, I didn't think there was another. Terman at Ohio.edu. And to learn more about the Shepherd program itself, just Google Shepherd Higher Education Consortium on Poverty, uh, or, it's, or you can go to shecp.org and learn more. There are also, you can uh, hear testimonials, students post essays. Hopefully, our students will be posting essays online about the experiences. You can also see information about all the range of activities that, were, that Bailey alluded to in terms of um, the, the opportunities and agencies and that Dr. Sherman said we do, they do a really good job of matching you uh, to agencies and so forth. But anyway, um, thank you all for attending. And again, let's give our panelists a, a, a warm round of applause.